The world's in a pretty peculiar spot right now. We're heading into our third year of quarantine with no foreseeable end in sight. Lockdown restrictions aren't really being taken seriously. And quote unquote black slang has been banned in some UK schools. This article was sent to me while working on this video, but I figured it was actually the perfect platform to discuss something that I feel has been swept under the rug a little. And it's kind of what black UK culture is. I've made videos and references in the past to how I feel to the tired, unfunny, same free punchlines about black British people. But it's not even specifically that that I'm discussing here. Something that's been made abundantly clear to me is that there's a fundamental misunderstanding of what this culture personifies, and even what the issues surrounding black people in the UK are. This is for a myriad of reasons, right? Americans have a very limited framework for what the culture personifies outside of, what, Sherlock, a British accent thrown on an evil character, and the preconceived association with whiteness in the colonial empire. And to be fair, that last point is valid, but I'm getting ahead of myself, right? Meanwhile, the internal discourse I often see on my timeline is something along the lines of, relationships in London, or or the, like the tribalism of Nigerians versus Jamaicans, when I think more could be done to focus on the actual institutional issues in the ruins of the empire. So let's start there. After the Windrush generation came through in the 1940s in order to help rebuild the country, most of them ended up residing in South London, in places like Brixton. For the record, the British Black Panthers were formed in Brixton and helped with soup kitchens and breakfast programs. I'll talk about them probably in a different video. Yeah, I haven't seen much coverage on them, so yeah, that's something else to do. <laughs> the main thing I want to communicate here is that these places became a central hub for those of Afro-Caribbean descent, and eventually their language and dialect bred throughout London. Terms like Wagwan, Mandem, Gaudem, Ra, they're so commonly used within central London nowadays, they come from Afro-Caribbean communities that settled way back, way back when. And to be blunt, they've become an integral part of youth culture in London. Well, maybe not integral, but they've become a key part, right? And this might be perceived as a good thing, right? In fact, you could argue that the fact that our language has quote-unquote ascended cultural barriers and formed this multi-language culture is undoubtedly a good thing, right? It's to the point where I've seen terms like these be submerged from Black British English to just British culture. That's just how British people speak. But this in itself is very dangerous framing. As once again, we look at how institutionally schools are demonizing our language and we have to also claim it as inherently British, only when it's convenient for them, of course. I, I grew up in school, I, this happened to me. They told us don't, they told us not to say these things. They told us you can't wear your hair certain way. Like there's a lot of restrictions and regulations. Sorry, this is off script. It's just, this is like a real thing. Like, yeah, I'm not surprised by this. This just happens. And yeah, like some things are so normalized that like it's almost, it's almost very difficult to be surprised by them. Anyway, I'm getting, I'm getting ahead of myself again. It's this contradiction of wanting elements of the culture to look cool when the time calls for it, but also disparaging it on an institutional level. It's not something that's lost on me. There was a clip I was sent of this white girl using multicultural English, and there was this huge debate on whether or not she was appropriating the language and culture. This is the only time that I'm going to address the way that I talk on this app, because you guys are giving me dance in the comments. I'm going to chat my back, and I really want to talk about this, because for some reason the way that girls talk of theme on lingo has become some kind of running commentary, some kind of joke recently, and I'm really not buying into it. So right, the comment says I want to hear how your parents talk. For the sake of argument, I'm going to assume that her parents have European accents, because she says she's from Lithuania. Even though they might have English accents for the sake of argument, do you understand? My dad has a Nigerian accent, but do I? Do you, do you see how that does not bang? It doesn't even make sense because you just put out your butt crack because we all know, yeah, that your accent and the way that you talk most likely comes from your school, your education, your area that you grew up in, which is your secondary socialization and the culture that is around that, which is exactly why in London, most people, even though they come from different areas, not all people, but most people sound the same and talk with the same slang, even though our parents are from different places. Do you understand? Cool. This leads me to the, my next thing, which is the only distinguishable factor between me and this girl is our race. As a black girl, I have really never experienced anyone talking about the way that I talk, even though, yeah, I talk really fast on this stuff and everyone's monkey about it. The way that I actually talk has never been an issue. So why is it when white girls talk, talk in a certain way, when they're the ones that have grown up in the same areas as all of us, people want to say something, people want to be calling them begs and all this. And the conversation of what constitutes as cultural appropriation is one I've had before, and it's one I've quietly grown a bit weary of. I don't find there to be a sophisticated debate on the cultural appropriation in media. It's less the act and more the ignorance behind it, which is the issue. I'm often asked to come on TV whenever a pop star wears cornrows and defend the idea that I'd like to police their lifestyle, but there's little interest in the broader picture of imperial racism and white supremacy that forms the context. So it ends up being a reductive conversation about whether or not it's okay for white people to do something, which isn't any of my business. Now I don't entirely agree with this perspective as I do have some issues with appropriation, but she makes a great point about how, by how focusing on the minuscule, we ignore the wider implications. Is the problem really that this white girl was, looks stupid? 
Is the problem really that this white girl looks stupid, talking with a hybrid of jargon from different cultures? Or is it that the origin of the language is institutionally demonized? Is it that black children are still five times more likely to be excluded from schools? I said this last time, but I was one of them. I was hopping secondary schools because no one would take me. That's what it means. British culture is such a stupid way of describing things. It's like saying African American is the same as being an American. It isn't. Black British identity was constructed on the backs of the black diaspora. When black people take pride in being black British, they're not taking pride in Britain, its colonial history or stupid Tory white people. They're taking pride in an identity and culture they've constructed for themselves in spite of that. There's a lot to love about it. And some things I'm not crazy about, but you know, yeah, <laughs> we, we take what we can get. I love how a lot of us have a strong touch with our African roots. There's a firm sense in most people from West Africa that they know where they're from and even what tribe. For me, I'm Nigerian and Yoruba, and sometimes people walk up to you on the street and they know where you are just from your face. They're like, you're Yoruba, you're Nigerian, I know. Somehow, and it's crazy. That's just a casual thing that can happen here. It's happened to me so many times. There's a station underpass by Waterloo where a bunch of black people just do graffiti. I go there quite often and pe the people there, are, they're, they're nice. They're like nice people. I want to say like four to five people walked up to me to say hi and to help with my bad art like a number of times so yeah no these people are really like there's re there's a, like a real community there i'm not really the biggest guy on the grime or draw scene but when i see artists doing innovative things with the style i love it i love nux i love drea mac and while i'd say i'm not as crazy about the big names as others like stormzy or santan daves the impact they have on the culture is undeniable london for all the problems i have with it feels so culturally diverse and the fact that I've been exposed to such a wide variety of people is a big factor into why I grew to care so much about the issues of others. And I look at all these tired, same free jokes and statements about black British culture and identity, and I play the grump because... I, like, I don't like playing the grump, but like, it looks really ignorant, because you have no idea what it's actually like here. What providence do you reside from, sir, young man? What? Of which location do you reside, my young fellow? I'm from Gryffindor. How dare you ask? Like, no one actually talks about this, but nobody actually talks like this. I say all of this to take pride, but also to bluntly state that it isn't British culture. And the false categorization of that is what leads to a situation where white people can claim cultural language that isn't their own, just to look cool, while also disparaging it on an institutional level. It doesn't help that the only media America is exposed to about the UK is the occasional villainous voice, Sherlock, T and Crumpets, right? Like, it's just like the biggest of stereotypes. There's, there's no strong commentary on what it's like to be Black British outside Black Britain. And even then, our media is very limited in our scope. I believe Akala talked about this in Race and Class in the Ruins of Empire, but whiteness has always been synonymous with British identity. Brexit is about British nationalism, and to be specific, white people's British nationalism. When something is incorrectly labelled as British culture, it's in some part an attempt to label it as a construct of whiteness, or at the very least, white people. And that does a disservice to the culture of black British people everywhere. Mm -hmm. I need to be thinking urban, more Negro, the black thing. That's what's happening now with the kids. I brought up how in the 1940s, black people came to effectively rebuild the country after the war. This was known as the Windrush Generation. Well, the Windrush Generation recently has been getting their citizenship revoked and being told that their citizenship isn't valid. This selective memory in Britain's history plays a massive role into the way blackness is perceived and functions here. This is another example where black people have been commodified and used by Britain, but selectively and you could argue strategically, thrown away when they're no longer necessary. Margaret Fratcher went on to say the integration, the, the cultural diversity, we were swamped. Isn't that crazy? Funnily enough, Operation Swamp 81, initiated by Margaret Thatcher, fun fact, initiated to reduce crime and what ended up happening were black communities in places like Brixton were targeted and as a direct result of that and many other factors, the Brixton riots happened. Our existence here isn't an extension of Britain's generosity, it's a product of the need for Britain to rebuild itself, nothing more. Everything else is just PR. It wasn't even two decades after black people had began sailing into the country that the British Black Panthers were formed as a response to the rampant arrests and stop and search laws. Did you know there's a thing called the SUS law? I'm not even... Oh my god. It was a stop and search law that allowed the police to search and arrest anyone under any form of sub subsist... Sub Whoa, what? It was a stop and search law that allowed the police to search anyone under any form of subsist... Suspicion. Oh my god, I cannot words today. 
The irony being that in a 2018 study by the British Journal of Criminology, stop and search has had a marginal impact on crime in the UK. Contrary to what Priti Patel might tell you, it doesn't address the systemic issues that lead to crime. All it did really was create issues with black and ethnic groups because the law was seemingly designed to be used against them. It's in the namesake. Five times more likely to be excluded. 75% of the youth being held in prison for trial are black. This exploitation and dismissal of black youth is really, it's well documented. Let's, no, let's, let's call it speech. It's really well documented. And this is where I want to hold off for one second. I remember growing up and hating my skin. I brought up the memory before, but in year two, I literally said, I wish I was a white person before my sister slapped me. I was kicked out of school and I had to go so I had to go soul searching a bunch of times. And my dad, you know, you know, he hated it. He went back and forth from Nigeria several times and something he always communicated to me was to stay obedient, to stay in line, don't talk back. Work twice as hard as the white kids and someday you might work with the white man. The reality is we were the first generation of our family to move to the UK and start a family. We didn't have a lot. And the last thing you want to do when you don't have a lot is to start trouble. The system does black youth no favours, criminalises them, robs them of their culture for PR and sends them to jail. Like I don't like to bring up our strained relationship with black Americans but America is the biggest superpower in the world and has the most media control. We don't have Disney Channel UK with that so raven in black British accents. Institutionally we don't even have a large foothold in British media. It's the white man's land. This isn't, this, this isn't like a knock right? But it's difficult for Americans to fathom how thoroughly their media is ingrained into our TV screens, especially comparatively speaking. Like how many black, how many black British shows do you actually know? Cause I don't know many either to be blunt. Top Boy, Kadulthood, I mean, anything else? The man them got anything else? No, <laughs> what? No, we ain't got enough. We're apparently overrepresented in crime. Like that's, that's our fault somehow. But somehow we're also underrepresented in our media. Isn't that interesting? In fact, a large reason why black British actors are, po are pouched or are pooched, I don't, is it pooched? For what are thought to be black American roles, right? Are because of unions. There are unions for them to be paid more, whereas producers can get away with playing black British actors less and banking on what is effectively exposure.jpg to, to, co to compensate, only to be treated with vitriol and blamed by the likes of Samuel Jackson for stealing roles. And I'm really getting, but I'm really getting ahead of myself here. London is so diverse, yet the system wants to homogenise us. Here's your school uniforms, be professional. We all British here, it's our culture. That's how Uncle Sam sees you, and that's how you should see yourselves. Us, we're all the same. We're not. The greatest part about being black British is knowing that you're a cultural melting pot of traditional African heritage, the mass media outreach of black American material, and the cultural contributions of the black diaspora to the diversity of London as a whole. The perceptions of others aren't so much a big deal to me anymore, as I can't control the way media propaganda has affected the general American perception of us. I think as a result of our contributions being institutionally dismissed, the conversation, culture and history gets buried as a result. And this is also really well documented. I want to talk a bit about a guy I met on the way to work. He was often on the Metropolitan line and he was asking for food. I have a food bank initiative but I didn't have the food on me because it was early and again, I was on my way to work. But I sat down and spoke to him and I found out he was from Brixton. And he literally said, they've gentrified the whole place and now I have nowhere to stay. Brixton, the same place. But something working on this food bank initiative has done is that it's recontextualized the way I view my community and what they're going through. I say all of this to say that while we're a hybrid of different cultures, the culture we've constructed isn't British culture. And historically, revoking our identity to the homogenous idea of Britishness has done more harm than good. Because even if you see yourself as a part of that, clearly the system doesn't. As a collective, we personify the black diaspora within the UK. And we have to do our part. 